All right, so this morning we are uh, finishing up our little uh, mini-series um, on these three parables uh, that are in Matthew uh, 25. So uh, we're, we're still in the parables. Uh, you know, we've been in the parables since February, so uh, we've been covering a lot of them, but, but there are a lot of parables to cover. Um, but today we're, we're going to finish up that little mini-series um, of, uh, of these um parables in Matthew 25, um, and then next week we're going to um, end uh, our series on the parables uh, by talking about the parables of money, so that'll be, that'll be fun. Uh, but two weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, you know, they're, they're there with their lamps, they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. You know, these are the bridesmaids for the wedding ceremony, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. He is delayed. Only five of them brought extra oil. Um, so when the, bri or when the bridegroom finally arrived, five of them were ready to go into the feast, and the other five had to go to the market to buy more oil. And as a result, they missed uh, the wedding feast. Um, last week, we looked at the parables of the talents, uh, and we had the master who went away and left uh, great sums of money with three of his servants and entrusted them with these talents, entrusted them with these with this money uh, to help him grow his kingdom. Uh, two of them were successful and one of them failed. Uh, and these two that were successful um, entered into the joy of the master. Uh, and he told them, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the other one he cast out. Um, but these parables show us um, the end of the age and, and this the eternity aspect of um, of life. Uh, this was at, right at the end of Jesus' ministry. This was the week before he went to the cross. So he was doing everything he could to teach his disciples and those who were listening to him that there was more to this life. It was more than just these, you know, this handful of years that we live on this planet. Um, you know, when we look at these parables, you know, the, the two we looked at last week um, and, and this parable we're looking at today, we can see um, that all uh, throughout all of eternity, people will be divided into two camps. You know, we can kind of see a sorting, everybody being sorted out in the way that we live life on this earth, the way that we live our, our mortal and human lives um, completely tells us whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now, honestly, this is this is a topic, you know, that we don't like to talk about. This is a topic, you know, that a lot of preachers, you know, want to kind of stay away from. You know, we don't, we don't like to think of people going to hell. We don't like to think of people missing out on the joy of heaven. We don't like to think about uh, the fact that people have turned their backs on God and pushed him away. We don't want to talk about the fact that there will be people who think they're in good shape, but in fact are not. You know, there's this big false theology that's rolling around now um, that, that all people go to heaven no matter what. But Jesus made it plain and clear here in Matthew 25 and in many, many other places through the, uh, uh, the Gospels that that's simply uh, just not true. So this morning we're going to close up uh, the 25th chapter of Matthew by looking at the parable of the sheep. Um, and the goats. And, and this is this is a, a small parable, really the parable part of it. It's only like one little verse, uh, one little sentence, and, and it's tied together with just this, this beautiful thing of, of, that shows us exactly what it looks like to follow Jesus and what Jesus is looking for uh, when he is coming to this time uh, of eternity. Uh, in this parable, Jesus is going to talk about uh, the separation of people and sorting people out um, and deciding which group each person will go into and where that group uh, will end out. So let's, ju uh, let's jump right into it here. This is verses 31 uh, through 46 uh, from Matthew 25. This is what it says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did you, we see you as a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will talk to those on the left. He will say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. They will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Such a great uh, passage uh, of scripture. There's such a wonderful image that Jesus gives us. You know, it's, you know, this is one of those where he just opens up and he just lets it all out. And he tells them exactly what is going on. Such a great view of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. What we are called to do and the reward that we get when we follow it. And the punishment for not following it. At the, big, at the beginning of this passage, we see Jesus carrying on with the theme of the end times and the truth that there is a heaven and a hell. Um, and in this parable, Jesus uses the analogy of sheep um, and goats. And, and again, Jesus is comparing himself to a shepherd. Over and over and over again, we see in the gospel, Jesus comparing himself to the shepherd and his believers of being the sheep. We see it over and over again. We see Jesus being the good shepherd. We see Jesus being the door for the shepherd. We see Jesus being the one who will lay down his life for his sheep. We see it over and over and over again. And Jesus is just going to use this analogy again. So he says, when the Son of Man returns and it's time to split people into what group, it's going to be like a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. Now, in the first century uh, shepherding community, it was pretty common to keep the goats and the sheep together. It, it was a mixed herd, and that was completely normal. You know, they didn't have sheep shepherds and goat shepherds. You know, they didn't keep them separate. You know, there wasn't enough, uh, you know, shepherds to go around for that. So they kind of had them all together. Now, the goats in and of themselves, you know, they had their purpose. They gave milk. You know, they were kind of there uh, to keep the sheep company. But it was the sheep that were really valuable. It was the sheep that the shepherds really cared about. You know, that, that, was, their, that was the golden goose uh, to say. You know, they had their wool that was given many times through the sheep's life. They could be given for meat. So the shepherds uh, would, would keep this mixed flock together, uh, but the sheep uh, were so much more important to them. And from afar, if you look at a, at a flock of goats and sheep, it would be hard to distinguish uh, between the two until you got up close. So what the shepherd would do when it was time to uh, take these sheep and goats to market is they would have to sit and separate them and move the sheep to one side and the goats to one side. The sheep will get the higher price and the goats will get a lower price. So this image of separating and making two groups between the sheep and the goats would have been totally understood by every single person listening to this parable. Um, also in Jewish and Jewish lore in their history, goats were seen as like dirty. Um, uh, they were symbolic of evil. They were black, smelly, nasty animals. It was believed that demons could possess goats, but not be able to possess sheep. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew word for goat and the Hebrew word for devil is exactly the same. It's the same exact word. So in this analogy, Jesus using here, it's, it's completely perfect. He says there are sheep. And there are goats, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the sheep are going to be this group that's blessed and gets to go into heaven. And this, this group of goats um, are, are cursed, and they will go into eternal punishment. The sheep are symbols of believers, and the goats are ones that have turned their back on God. He says these ones on the right hand, the sheep, the followers of Christ, will enter into the inheritance that has been set forth since the foundation of the earth. But these here on the left... These goats, these are ones that will be there um, and accept the punishment uh, that has been there since the beginning of the world, since the foundation of the world, the eternal punishment. So Jesus paints this, this beautiful picture of sorting. This is the Son of Man sorting those who have gained eternal life with Him by following Him and those that have not because they have rejected Him. And this goes right along with what we've been talking about uh, these last two weeks. There will be a time where we are judged. There will be a time where there will be a sorting. 
There will be a time when we are either welcomed into heaven or banished to hell. There will either be a time uh, where, where God lets us into the bridegroom, uh, to, to the wedding supper of the Lamb, and, and, or, or lets us or makes us stay out, and we stay out knocking, trying to get in. Or there's a time where we'll come to God and be greeted with the term, well done, good and faithful servant, or we'll be uh, greeted with, with, the, with the phrase, away from me, you evildoer. You see, our entire lives and everything we do comes down to this sorting, it comes down to this picking, it comes down to whether you're on the left or the right. Everything that we do our entire time here on earth comes down to this one moment. This one moment. In the book of Revelation, we see this laid out for us at the very end. And we read the, when we read this parable from Jesus in Matthew 25, and we look at these verses in Revelation, we can see that this is the same exact event that he's talking about. This is from Revelation 20. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And then I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. And then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written into the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So here we see Jesus on the throne and we see every human being who has ever existed coming to the foot of this throne. And every single person going up against these books, this, this book of their life and what they had done while they were on earth. And they were being judged according to this book. And we see these people judged according to what they had done on the earth. And it says that every single person who did not have their name written in the book of life were thrown into the lake of fire. Thrown into the lake of fire. Now, that doesn't mean that the people who have their name written in the book of life were perfect and don't have anything against them in these other books because we all know that we do. But they accepted Jesus. So here we see this, this picture of a sorting, the sorting ceremony. All of you line up. Uh, some of you go to the left. Some of you go to the right. Some of you have your name written in the book of life and your sins are covered by the blood of the lamb. Uh, but then there are some who never came to Jesus and never accepted, accepted or opened that book, that grace, that gift of grace. We see this stage and this scene that is set and we see the people in these groups that are awaiting their faith. You see Jesus on the throne, the one who gave his life so that all could come to him and all could be redeemed, yet some do not. So we see all of humanity in two groups. One's being let into the wedding feast and one's being shut out. So then we come back to this parable of, of the sheep and the goats and Jesus talking about separating them. And then after he talks about separating them, then he starts talking about this dialogue. He has this dialogue between the king and those that he's laying in and then a dialogue between the kings and, and the king and those who are being left out. He tells those on the right, he says, he says, you are blessed because when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. And that is why you were blessed. And the people are like, when, when do we ever see you? When do we ever see the king of kings hungry or thirsty or naked or sick? And Jesus tells them this great truth. He says, whatever you did for the least of these brothers, that's what you were doing for me. What you did for the least, what you did for the lowest of the low, that's what you did for me. Now think about this just for a moment. We don't need to linger on it too long, but it's worth considering. If a king walked through our door right now, how would we treat this king? If a king walked into our church right now, we would give him the best seat. We'd give him the seat of honor. If we had any food, we'd give him the best food. We'd give him the best drink, the best clothes, everything. And we would just take care of this king. But what if a drunk homeless man walked through the door? What if a drunk homeless man walked through the door? Would we give him the best seat, give him the best food, give him the best drink, give him the best clothes? There's no way. You see, we're always going to treat a king better than we treat 
a homeless person. But that's the whole point of this parable. That's the whole point of what Jesus is talking about here, is taking care of the least, taking care of the smallest and most insignificant people in society. Giving grace and mercy to those who truly need it, taking care of those that are down, taking care of those who are down on their luck, they've fallen on hard times, doing everything that we can as God's people to extend his love to them. Now, as much as the judgment language in this image of a sorting, in this image of heaven and hell, um, really wants to catch our, ten, uh, our attention, that's not the full purpose of this parable. That's not the main point of this parable. The emphasis is first on the responsibility of God's people to show compassion. To show compassion. The foundational idea is that our relationship to God is by necessity, by rule, by command, lived out in our relationship with other people. A person cannot be a follower of Christ and be empty of compassion at the same time. A follower of Christ cannot be empty of compassion because compassion is the centerpiece of the gospel. Yet why have so many Christians, why have so many Christians come to the conclusion that they can accept grace but not pass it on? Why have so many Christians accepted God's grace with open arms, yet not offered it back to other people? Why will we accept the love of God, a God who went out of his way to save us by sending his own son? Why can we accept that love, but not be willing to turn and lift a finger to help other people? How can God's people be bathed in the love of God, yet not be a fountain for a world that so desperately needs it. You see, for some reason, we've come to a place where we have separated the Bible into different boxes. We, we've, taken, we've taken the gospel, and we've broken it up and put it into little boxes. Over here in this box, we've got Jesus loves me. We've got in this box, we've got Jesus loves me. And because he came and died on the cross, I have the opportunity to go to heaven. In this box, I've got the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Yet in this box over here, I've got love others. In this box over here, I've got feed the hungry, take care of the widows, take care of the orphans. In this box over here, I've got spread the good news. In this box over here, I've got the great commission. In this box right here, I've got make disciples. In this box right here, I've got teach others. But for some reason, what we've done in Christianity is we've taken all that and kind of shoved it to the side and just grabbed this right here and lived in this and left all of that alone. We love the box that says Jesus loves me. We love the box that says amazing grace. We love the box that says blessed assurance. But we don't want to come over here and get dirty. We want to accept God's love and bask in it, but we don't want to turn and give it to other people. But what Jesus does in this parable is he lets his people know that these are all connected. There's no separating the gospel. There's no separating God's love from loving other people. It is the same thing. God made sure that his people knew that they were connected and not only connected in a tangible way, but eternally connected. He says, the ones of you that are going to heaven, you're going to heaven because you took care of the least of these. You're going to heaven because you love others. You're going to heaven because you took care of people. And for those of you on the left who are not going to heaven, you're not going because you didn't take care of the least of these. Now, obviously, there's more to the equation than that. We have to put our faith in Jesus, and we have to confess our faith and repent and be baptized, and we have to follow Jesus. And a part of following Jesus is loving others and taking care of others and living a life that is marked with the love that God has given us. When we open up the gospel, when we open up and we look what God has done for us and what Jesus has done for us in the amazing and reckless love that God had for us, there is no way that we can't pass that on to every single person that, has come, that we come in contact with. 
Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 4. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves with the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. He says, love one another earnestly. Show hospitality, serve others, and give the glory to God. These are the marks of a Christian. These are the marks of a follower of Jesus. These are marks of, of people who will enter into God's inheritance because of the way they live. But goodness gracious, sometimes we don't see that in the American church, do we? Sometimes we don't see that uh, in the American church at all. We don't see love and service and hospitality. Instead, we see hate and wanting to be served and hostility. And that is the opposite of what we should be portraying. That is the opposite of the gospel. That's the opposite of the reflection of Jesus. Jesus loved, therefore we should love. Jesus served, therefore we should serve. Jesus gave up things for us, therefore we should give up things for other people. Jesus showed grace and mercy, therefore so should we. Jesus went above and beyond for all, for even for those who didn't deserve it, especially for those that didn't deserve it, and so should we. We have to be doing all that we can to take care of all people and to show Christian hospitality and mercy to all. When we take care of people who are down and out, that shows the gospel. When we take care of the least of these, that shows the gospel because that's exactly what the gospel is. When Jesus went to the cross, he was going to the cross for the least of these. Because when we step back and look at who we were before Jesus, we were completely failing in life. Humanity was completely failing before Jesus because there was no way that we could ever get back to God. There was no way we could ever provide ourselves a way back to God. There was no way we could ever live a good enough life to be good enough to get back to God. So the gospel is Jesus coming to save those who could not even help themselves even one little bit. We were the least. We were the broken. We were the lost, never having a chance of ever saving ourselves, yet God comes down and saves us. That is the good news of the gospel, and that's what we pass on when we serve others, especially the least of these. Now, I know this is one of those things that, you know, I could sit up here and talk about this all day, and you're going to agree with me over and over and over again, and on paper, we're like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but, but some of these things, uh, you know, we got to look at them in the real world. What does it take to take care of the least of these in the 21st century? How can God's people uh, give God's love and mercy to those that need it? First of all, it has to start in our hearts. That's where it starts first and foremost. If you try to love on the least of these and to go out and serve the least of these without having your heart opened up, it's just gonna, you're just going to be going through the motions and you're doing it just to knock it off a checklist and that's it. We have to open our hearts for the broken, for the lost in our communities. We need to be open and willing to go and love on the people of our society that tells us not to love on. And this isn't always easy. Look, I've spent many nights in homeless shelters and, and drug rehab uh, places uh, visiting with these people and preaching out, preaching to these guys and hanging out with these guys. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes these are the, the, the last person that you want to hang out with. But these are the people that God is calling us to love. And we have to ask God to give us his love and mercy uh, so that we can love on other people. We have to ask for God to break our hearts for those people in our, in, in our society that are down around us. We also have to open up our hands. We cannot take care of other people if we are unwilling to let go of the blessings that God has given to us. We cannot take care of the least of these if we are too busy holding on to what God has given us. 
Last week we talked about using our time and talents and treasures for the kingdom of God. It is impossible for us to use those for the kingdom of God if we are unwilling to give them away. It is impossible to serve other people if we are unwilling to give up of our time. It is impossible for us to help other people if we are unwilling to let go of the blessings that God has given us. It is impossible for us to use the talents that God has given us if we are too busy using them to build our own kingdom here on earth. We have to open up our hands and let go of the things that God has given us so that we can use them to bless the people who need to be blessed. And finally, we have to open up our doors. And this is the one that is the most uncomfortable. We have to let people in. You know, figuratively and literally, we talk about opening up our hearts. We have to open up our hearts and form relationships with those who are the least of these so that we can love them more, so that we can serve them more, so, so that we can be a better minister to them. And we have to open up the doors of our homes and churches. We need to be willing to take care of the least of these in any way that we can. Maybe feeding them a meal or letting them have a place to lay and rest when they need it. Creating an environment of full inclusiveness and welcoming in our churches so that when people come in, they feel welcome and loved. Taking care of others, especially the least of these, is our biggest call. And when we read this parable, we can see how important it is. How we treat others is how we show if we belong to God or not. It's how we show that we are followers of Christ. Because here's the deal, we can claim to be followers of Christ, we can claim to be Christians, but if we treat people poorly, then we are just full of it. If we claim to be followers of Jesus, but we're just awful human beings to other people, and we never take care of other people, then we are just liars who are either trying to fool other people or fool ourselves. We may be able to fool man, but we will never fool God. When Jesus is there sorting it out at the end, and he is choosing which group to put people in, let there be no doubt. Place your faith in Jesus, confess your faith, repent, be baptized, follow Jesus, and love others with everything that you have. Look what Jesus says in John 13. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says you will, people will know if you are mine or not by the way you treat other people. People will know if you are mine if you treat people the way you should treat them, the way that I have treated you. And on the day of judgment, we will see if we truly are Christ and how the way that we love other people while we're here on earth. You see, this reminder of, the, of judgment um, is an assessment not only in what we do, it's an assessment of what we don't do, what we have failed to do. And the fact that there is a judgment for what we have failed to do makes us uncomfortable. But this parable does not seek our comfort. Jesus did not seek our comfort when he was, when he was giving this, and I am not seeking your comfort right now. In fact, I hope you're a bit uncomfortable. For some reason, the American church and society as a whole doesn't give much attention to judgment. You sweep it under the rug and explain faith in such a way that little is necessary in order to get to heaven. But judgment is an important part of teaching because if there is no judgment, there's nothing to be saved from. If there is no possibility of eternal punishment, then there's no reason to have a savior. We don't need Jesus if there's nothing to be saved from. There's no reason to show love or hospitality or mercy and grace to others if there's no detriment if we don't and no reward if we do. Now judgment's not the only motivation for mercy and compassion, but it is one and it is a necessary one. The strongest witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ are lives that live out love and mercy and compassion and grace for all. We cannot follow Jesus without loving others. 
We cannot love God without loving others. We cannot accept grace from God without extending that same grace to other people. We cannot accept this mercy from God without extending that mercy to other people. We can't accept this reconciliation that God is offering us without also offering that to other people. See, experiencing this compassion from God should make us a fountain of compassion for all. So look at yourself. Look at your life. Look at where you are with all of this. Are you taking care of the least of these? Is your heart open to all? Are your hands open to all? Are your doors open to all? And as you look at your life, are you passing on the same compassion and redemption and mercy and grace and love that God and Jesus has passed on to you? Even when you didn't deserve it. When people see you, and when they see the way that you treat other people, can they tell beyond the shadow of a doubt that you belong to Jesus? When time comes to stand before this white throne judgment and Jesus says to you, uh, come on in, will he say, you fed me? Well, he said, you gave me drink, you clothed me, you took care of me, you visited me, you ministered to me. Come on into the inheritance. Because you took care of the least of these. Or is he going to say, you weren't there for me? You didn't feed me, you didn't give me drink, you didn't clothe me, you didn't take care of me at all. See, there are eternal blessings or eternal consequences on the way that we live this life, and we are called to show mercy and grace and love to all. So take a moment and check yourself and make the commitment today to love and serve others and to go to the ends of the earth to take care of other people, even the least of these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. and God, we're so thankful uh, for this parable. We're so thankful that we can open up your word. Open up your word and know that there will be a time where we are sorted, where we are either sent to heaven or sent to hell. Where we either welcome in with you or cast out. God, please forgive us for the times where we didn't take care of other people. Where we took care of ourselves and that was it. Forgive us for the times where we were not marked with love and mercy and compassion. God, we pray, we pray that you will please break us. That you will break us and show us the ones that we need to love. With. And God, we pray that your love will be what marks our life. So that when people see us, they see you, and they see your love. So your sons and pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we could come to your house this morning. We are thankful that we were allowed to lift our voices in praise and to open up your word. God, be with us as we leave this place. Let us be a people dedicated to mercy, dedicated to grace, and dedicated to your love. We love you and we are yours. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.